Welcome, everyone. My name is Shelley Gladstein. I'm the host and the founder of Osteo Boston. And welcome. Uh, tonight, we're very excited to have our special guest with us. And before we introduce her to you, I just want to say that um, I really appreciate our Osteo Boston members that are on tonight on their Zoom link. And uh, if you're listening to this on YouTube, that's awesome. We appreciate the way that you have responded to our program. And if you like it, what you hear today, go ahead and give us a thumbs up. And if you'd like to see more of this uh, kind of content, then please go ahead and subscribe to our channel. So now I'd like to tell you a little bit about our speaker. I want you to welcome our me the medical anthropologist and certified clinical nutritionist, Dr. Susan Brown. PhD, the founder of the Center for Better Bones and Alkaline for Life. Dr. Brown is a noted researcher, an inspirational speaker, and a best-selling author with over 1,000 website articles and hundreds of videos, as well as the author of three books, including The Acid Alkaline Food Balance, A Food Guide, Better Bones, Better Body, Beyond Estrogen and Calcium, and thirdly, Natural Bone Health, a Practitioner's Guide to Healthy Bones, Joints, and Muscles, written also with Dr. Russell Jaffe. Dr. Brown is a pioneer in the natural approach, approach to bone health with science-based solutions. We'll provide an even more extensive list of her accolades on the YouTube link of the description below. And will you please now welcome our wonderful speaker, Dr. Susan Brown. Thanks, Shelley. It's a, it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, I've known you for a long time now, and I really appreciate the initiative you've taken to, um, to help the public understand the broader perspective on bone health, which you yourself expanded with me uh, several years ago. And it's a delight. I've seen some of your interviews. They're very nice. So congratulations. And it seems like you have a pretty, how many women in your group right now? How many people in your group are in this meeting here? Uh, Just rough. I think there's about 40 of us right on. Yeah. Um, That's great. Uh, but we have probably more than several hundred uh, in our group. But yeah, uh, yeah and then we have a, quite a big YouTube following, so. Yeah. yeah, it's really, it's very important that we learn and share, and uh, let's get going, see what I can help you with. Great. So would you like us to ask questions? Uh, should that, um, we were thinking that maybe you would share a little bit about the, the top vitamins and nutrients and maybe eating habits that we should adopt in order to have a healthier bone composition. Well, you know, I mean, I'm happy to talk about whatever you would like, and I'm happy to answer questions, but let's just put it, let me put my work in a little bit of perspective, because as an anthropologist, I began years ago, actually 35 years ago, thinking about bone health when my grandmother fractured at 101. She was in the bathtub at, a bathtub at 101. Now, you can imagine what everyone was thinking, leaving her in the bathtub alone at 101. These were the old days, and she fractured. Um, she fractured a hip, uh, her sons, my father said, we can take you to the doctor. She said, no, I've been there before. She said, I've taken care of my sons for a hundred years and I'm going to, and they can take care of me. And she actually was in bed for one year in a perfectly wonderful cognitive state. She was very mentally alert. She never complained ever in one minute in her life. She had both osteoporosis and rickets. And some of you have seen my blogs or some of my sites. I have some videos of her. These were the first video my father happened to have a very early video machine decades ago. And it was striking how, how women, farm women, country women adapted to this situation of both osteoporosis and rickets. And we and rickets, you notice, because they have bowed legs, for example. And the osteoporosis was, of course, as many women, she fractured the collar first. The collarbone often is the first to fracture. Then she fractured the wrist. Then and she, of course, lost substantial heights, never, ever complained once of any kind of pain, never anyone even thought that there was, they kind of, we 
just until a friend of mine from South America came. I spent a lot of time in Colombia. My Colombian friend came. She said, you know, your grandmother both has osteoporosis and rickets. I said, wow. And then I go to the dentist and the dentist says to me, you know, you have receding gums. You should see a periodontist. And I knew then that receding gums are the first sign of bone loss. Recede the jawbone is the only bone you can see. And when you have receding gums, it's a sign that you're losing bone mass in that jaw. And when you have periodontal disease, it means your immune system is weakened and you're having an infection in those pockets that develop. And so I said, well, I'm going to learn about this. But you know what the real motivation was? I wondered how long my grandmother would have lived if she didn't have both osteoporosis and rickets. And I'll tell you, after all these decades working on this, I can tell you one of the most important things I've learned, we can talk about foods and we can talk about this and kind of that, but really important is the thoughts you have, your emotional attitude and your willingness to be accepting of life in a cheerful way. Like this woman never complained about anyone in her whole life. There'd be some big town drunks. She'd say, oh, he's the sweetest guy. He's doing the best he can. And now I realize that negative thoughts, what we think we become, and these constant negative thoughts that we don't even kind of just like little things that occur to us, but we would do well to survey our thoughts and see what we're thinking and what we're expecting because expectations dictate outcome. If you're running around saying, well, I've got horrible osteoporosis, I'm probably gonna fracture. The doctor said, I'm gonna end up in a wheelchair. That sets an energy that's not very good for you. And in fact, uh, my career is sort of moving in a different way. You know, I, for 10 years, 10, 20, now 30 years, I've taught the nuts and bolts. The book, Better Bones, Better Body, was really the first major thoughtful book, Rethinking Osteoporosis. So when my grandmother fractured, I said, gosh, I wonder what it's like around the world. How many people really fracture? Is it natural to fracture as you get older? Well, it wasn't natural to live to 101 in those days, but so you could say, well, that's possible why she had the fracture. But I looked around the world and there was an immense variation in fracture rates. Some cultures had very few fractures. Other might have six, seven, eight hundred per hundred thousand. And that now persists still. It's still at least a 10 or 20 fold fracture difference if you take hip fractures because they're quite easy to measure in cultures around the world. So this is a cultural de determined phenomenon by our lifestyle and, and our whole way of adjusting to the world. Particularly, I'm fascinated now with thought patterns and beliefs and all that. Um, we, are the, we are the richest country in the world. We spend most on medical care, yet still 32 other countries, people live longer than we do. And many, many countries have lower fracture rates. In fact, I just saw a recent study on uh, hip fractures looking around the world and there's still an immense variation in hip fractures and the most westernized cultures have most fractures. So we maybe think what's going on here, you know? So I became very interested with that, partly for my own case, but mostly for my grandmother. And then you know what kept me interested for 35 years is the absolutely marvelous nature of this human body. You have like 36 trillion cells, each cell, conducting thousands of chemical reactions every second, each cell knowing what every other cell is doing. There's nothing in the universe as intelligent as this body. So my campaign has always been, how can I understand the magnificence of this body? And then how can I possibly understand how I can enliven that intelligence? Unfortunately, many things we do in this culture dampen the intelligence. Uh, many things from the from the toxins in the food to the medications we take to this barrage of negativity to the to the stressful threats to the life around us so i i became very interested in cross cultural analysis of health and bone health and when you take a sober look at this you see we are very rich countries spend an immense amount on medical care yet we have not the outcome that you would hope that other much simpler cultures have um, so that's what I started out with. And then I said, well, we've got this problem of many people fracturing. Uh, just how many people fracture 
is interesting. I would tell you that the fracture rates are decreasing. The hip fracture rates have dramatically decreased over the last few decades. And most people don't tell you that. The hip fracture rates here in this country, in England, and Sweden, all over in the advanced cultures. And it's important to keep that in mind. Half the hip fractures occur when people who are in nursing homes and disabled. And so, and they 95% occur because of falls. So what we started to think about, when we think about the causes of fracture, I'm interested in fracture. I'm not interested in bone density. 90% of the bone density tests have errors in them. 50% are significant errors. These are studies that are well-established. Um, we're actually, we actually are looking for new ways to assess bone strength. And there's some fun things coming up. You know, they've tried drilling a little probe into the body to see if they can pull out some bone or how difficult it is to stick this pin in there. They've tried, they're trying CAT scans. CAT scans are probably pretty accurate, but CAT scans are a terrific amount of radiation. And I certainly think that that is not a life supporting way to be looking at bone strength. That's for sure. But there is a new way that some of you might have heard of. It's ultrasound an ultrasound called Echolite. This is an Italian device that actually sends a sound signal into bone. And then when that signal comes back, it can compare that signal with the signal that comes back from people who have fractured. It measures the architecture of bone. Did you have someone talking about Echolite in your group? You the know, I'm not sure if that's what we've got next month. We do have something um, well, don't worry about it. Don't worry. Just keep your mind. Yeah, I believe we have somebody speaking from uh, Europe about um, a new new modality. Uh, is by any? Uh, yeah, I, I forget. Um, Lorraine is. Are you on, Lorraine? I I don't know her, but there it's 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 yeah. it's ultrasound. You know, there might be another modality, but the, what I'm talking about is ultrasound. A lot of okay. okay. A lot of so it's very, something is going to come up because everyone knows the bone densities are not really, they're not really accurate. Eight, 70 or 80% of all fractures occur in people who have either osteopenia or normal bone density. They don't occur in people with osteoporosis. <clears throat> and osteoporosis was never defined by bone density. I mean, it was never defined by DEXA until just 30 years ago when they invented these machines. I was at Harvard. I was at Harvard when they invented this machine in 1985. I was invited to a meeting at Harvard. I actually got myself invited because I wanted to see, I was just starting to study bone. I said, let's see what they know. But see what we know. So the, the people were there who developed the whole logic and the lunar machines, the machines that are used today, the machines that have ended up having you identify yourself as having something as osteopenia, which was never even a concept before, and osteoporosis, which was never be defined by this bone density. They have made a whole category. <clears throat> Millions of women feel that they're, that they have a disease, which they may not, that they may not have at all. And so <clears throat> then in Harvard, these individuals, I'm gonna tell you this story because this, what I can tell you, I'm, anybody can tell you about vitamins and minerals. I can tell you, I've written books on it. I've got a hundred blogs on it. But what people don't understand is the history to it. You know, to step back and say, what's really happened with the treatment of bone health in this country. Mm -hmm. So they had this machine. They said, we're to, we now, 1985, we're gonna be able to tell you who's gonna fracture because we've got this machine that we're measuring what we call bone density. Now, you know, if you study this, that it really doesn't measure bone density, it's an aerial measurement. So it's number one, very affected by area. So small people like Shelly have smaller bones, they're gonna get a lower bone density. Bone density as measured by DEXA is directly related to weight, clearly related to weight. So lower weight people are gonna have lower bone densities. And so then they said, but that's okay, we're gonna, we're gonna figure this out. It, it took many, so this was 1985, they went, People bought drug companies, sponsored these machines. They went and bought these machines. All the drug companies were involved in incurring the proliferation of these machines. That was the same time that Fosamax was coming out, right? And so they said, okay, we're going to go measure a whole bunch of people. So they measured for 10 years, they measured women. Then they come back and say, okay, we got all this data. Now we're going to compile it. And we're going to see, we're going to, we, we know, they said, that if we, we've got our T-scores, and a T-score is simply just the statistical, how far you are away from the average. Well, if you're this far away from the average, they said, we're gonna call it osteopenia. That's minus one 
standard deviation. And if you're minus 2.5 standard deviations, we're going to call that osteoporosis. And the people with osteoporosis are the ones who are going to fracture. That was the theory. So they spent, they had the data, they set, it was 10 men who were in, who got the title of uh, the World Health Organization. I don't know how they got designated that. They established these T-scores as the new definition of osteoporosis. Before that, the definition was always quite simple. Bones that were so uh, insufficient that they would fracture needlessly. That was the old fashioned definition. And frankly, in my book, I think that's still the best definition. If you have not fractured and if your teeth aren't falling out, I, I would certainly not put that title on myself of having osteoporosis because of these bone density tests. So what they say, okay, we're gonna go out and now we got this data. We know who has osteoporosis, who has osteopenia. So it's in 10 years, another 10 years, this is 30 years collecting data. They get that data together and then they start, then someone says, well, let's analyze who actually fractures. And with the, that's when they found out all over the world, in Europe as well as here, anywhere from 60 to 80 percent of all fractures occur in people with either osteopenia or normal bone density. So it's not, it didn't work out. It was a good try, but it didn't work out as a way to predict fracture. And if your definition of osteoporosis is vulnerability, a bone that's architecture is weak or that was excessive loft that fractures needlessly, if that's your definition, then it's not suitable to use the T-score. And my only consideration with that is that I see hundreds, I've seen hundreds, thousands of women totally terrorized because they've been told they have severe osteoporosis, they're probably going to fracture, they're probably going to end up in a wheelchair. And frankly, uh, I don't think it does justice. I don't think it does justice to women. That's not to say, and it'd be fun, there are many of you that probably say, look, I've already fractured, I got a big problem going on. You had uh, my friend Keith McCormick on, and McCormick is really fascinating. I mean, he had many fractures. He beat himself up terrifically as an athlete. He had an unusual situation of like seven fractures. He did an immense program, including a hundred vitamins and minerals and, and including drug therapy. And so he, he found the solution to his problem. But for the person who says, no, I haven't fractured, but they just say, I've got this low bone density. So I call myself as having osteoporosis. Uh, what you think you become, I wouldn't do it. I, would, I, would, I might say I have a challenge to build bone strength. What you, if you say, well, Susan, how can you sort this out? One thing really important is, and it hasn't paid enough attention to, that there is a very clear link between muscle strength and bone strength. So as you build muscle, you will build bone. And as you lose muscle, you lose bone. And this is the work, uh, the fascinating work by this is the Australian Bone Clinic. And you should have Belinda Beck on your little group. Belinda Beck is a major researcher from Australia, a doctor who's dealt years and years with exercise and how you build bone. They have an Australian bone clinic. They have these women, older women, doing like what you would call like Olympic type weightlifting, squats, deadlifts, pull-ups. Those women at 60, 70, 80 are gaining bone density and substantial bone density. I had a client who did this program on her own and she gained 20% in the hip. She loved weightlifting. Her son helped her. The caveat is you have to do it very carefully and you have to have good supervision. Belinda Beck has started, when I interviewed Belinda Beck a couple of years ago, because the data is so strong, the Australian Bone Clinic, you can look it up, that I interviewed in that very same day, a physical therapist from New Jersey who happens to work with her husband who likes, who is a weightlifter, called Belinda Beck, got the first franchise in the US for this strength training program of the Australian Bone Clinic, which in the US is called ONERA, O-N-E-R-A. There's several sites around the country now. I, is there anyone in Boston doing it? Do you know? I don't know. Not yeah. to, know. It's a to look that up. Does anyone else know? Raise your hand if, no, well, it's okay. Go yeah, ahead. yeah, yeah. My, my office can tell you, I, they, may not have, they may not have gotten that part now, but there's several, and mm -hmm. I was really delighted because it was because of my interview that that woman called Dr. Beck the same day, and then she, and Dr. Beck had been planning to franchise into other countries because it's so, because she's just part of the team that says we can regenerate bone health, and that doesn't mean everyone's going to want to do it, but there'll be certain people that say, hey, I like the idea of being strong. I'm going to get strong. If you get physically strong, 
it'll be a, a really big help to building bone. And on the other hand, you might say, yeah, but take your friend McCormick, you know, this poor guy, he, 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 he was, he was exercising unbelievably, but you can go beyond, you can deplete yourself with exercise. So you want to do it very thoughtfully and you want to make sure that you, uh, and you can tell if you say, gee, I did this exercise and I feel exhausted afterwards. You know, it's, you might be better doing Tai Chi or yoga or Qigong. Mindful exercise is going to help too. Why? Sure, you work the muscles and you build strength, but you calm the nervous system and you coordinate the meridians of energy. We are working on a very gross understanding of bone health. It's all about a very complicated circuitry of energy within the body, energy that's connected to that cosmic energy that rules this very planet. The same order you see in the planets occur within this body. And the trick is to awaken that intelligence. That's what I'm interested in now. How do we awaken the intelligence of our human body, which is the most magnificent creation in the universe, how do we stop poisoning it? How do we stop poisoning it with food and environmental toxins and with thoughts and expectations that are not life supporting? You know, we're swimming upstream. We're, we're, so, so the muscle bone link is really important. And there's many other ways to gauge the strength of bone, particularly we'll be looking, you'll be maybe get a chance to look at the echo light. Um, and there's some new science that's really fun, like with astronauts. You know, if these, if, if uh, this hurry to get to the moon is kind of interesting because when they get to Mars or get to Mars, they're not going to be able to walk because they lost so much muscle and so much bone that you lose without gravity, you use, lose a terrific amount of muscle and bone. Just like if you lay in bed for a couple of weeks, you're going to lose a lot, much less take a trip out in space for like six months, three months. And so what they've developed, they're spending a lot of money to how to develop bone in a gravity-free environment. And keep an eye out for it. It's a device called Osteo Boost. Have you seen it? It's called Boost. And it's going to be a pack you wear on your back. And it's a little vibrational field that it sets up. They figured out the frequency that stimulates the bone building cells, which is about 30 hertz. They set it in this little pack that they put in the astronauts. And they're making it, they're trying to, they're doing FDA approval for that now. So you're going to see some nice non-drug treatments coming up. I think that the pulse electromagnetic field in that particular device, because it's highly funded to research it, I think it's, I think it's real interesting. So just, just one more minute for the introduction to me. So I, oh, so, the, so then I said, okay, I want to develop a program. I see that osteoporosis doesn't occur all over the world. I see that weak bones do not happen to everyone. In fact, there's certain cultures like the Amish, the bones get stronger the older the women get because they do so much work. Um, so I developed a program and this is the Better Bone Solution Program. Just you can just see it a little bit, but basically the first thing that's always important is to assess the case. So those of you that say, well, this is interesting, but, uh, but I think I've got a problem. You want to assess, you want to, there's a series of tests that the doctor should always do if they think there's excessive bone loss or if you think there's excessive bone loss. And this is called the Medical Osteoporosis Workup. It's on my website. You can go to betterbones.com. Just look for the blog about medical, uh, medical osteoporosis workup. And I, I've, this is one of my greatest contributions because this has caused hundreds of thousands of women to demand that their doctors look for the causes of the problem, whether it be loss of calcium in the urine, whether it be high parathyroid, whether it be high cortisol, whether it be because they have an autoimmune disorder or because they have an inflammatory response. It is such a common sense thing. Where else would you just give a person a drug and never even bother to look and see what the problem was? And so you can uncover a great deal about the cause. So the first thing is to assess the case. Then the the diet that you, the diet that we want is a high mineral diet that keeps the pH in balance. Some of you familiar with acid-base balance in bone? Anyone familiar with that? Yeah, well, certainly Shelly is because I've drilled it into her over the years, but yeah, bone are a great reservoir of alkaline mineral. And they know what the important function is. You'd say, well, it's so that I can walk and so I can protect my organs and I can produce white blood cells. And, but that's not the most important thing. The most important thing about the skeleton is it allows you to maintain pH balance. 
you will die within seconds if your pH strays too much. Mother Nature knew this, so it packed the bone with alkalizing compounds. These are minerals of calcium and phosphates and phosphorus that can be called on instantly to buffer the acid in the blood so that you always have a constant blood pH. The diet we're talking about is a diet we evolved on for hundreds of thousands of years, high in vegetables, fruits, nuts and seeds, spices, herbs, protein, but not too much protein. This, our chemistry is evolved. I mean, when you think about it, it was a pretty big experiment to come up with a human. You know, you're talking about, you're talking about, you know, eons of time of experimentation with nature to perfect this machine. And it, and they had, and Mother Divine developed a little process where we have a storage of these alkalizing compounds to keep that pH precise. So we do a diet that provides a lot of these minerals because minerals are attached to something and the minerals we like are attached to alkalizing compounds like citrates and carbonates and ascorbates and all that sort of stuff. So, and it's the same diet. They'll, if you go to somebody a diet for cancer, heart disease, diabetes, the same kind of thing. Only we can measure it. We can measure the first morning urine and get a really good idea if you have enough alkali buffering reserves. And that's, and, and at betterbones.com, you can see the little kit I developed, the pH test kit. I'm also excited now that this pH thing is taken off, even though it's a little distorted. Like I saw a truck here in Syracuse, a massive truck with pH water company. And you see, and pH of nine, they touted. Well, that's not the issue. It's, it's not, I can, I've written a whole blog on this whole thing of alkaline water per se. It's, it's not helping. What you need is high mineral water. But anyway, I'm happy to say that things are evolving. So you have to do the diet, then supplements. I was the first, I was the one who sat down and looked at and said, there's 20 nutrients that are absolutely essential for bone. And in my website, you can find those 20 key bone building nutrients. You can see the doses that we recommend. Manganese, zinc, copper, boron. Of course, ascorbate, vitamin C is such a key nutrient. Vitamin K, we were the first ones to work with vitamin K and now everyone is paying attention to vitamin K. Vitamin K2 is MK7, is the one known factor that can help prevent arterial calcification. And one of the things we detected years ago along with other smart people like Sherry Rogers, Dr. Rogers, that if you flood the body with calcium, you're running the risk of, of ending up with arterial calcification. And that's what they're finding in certain numbers of people. And even breast calcifications are a sign that your, cal your chemistry is out of balance, you're calcifying things. So the MK7, vitamin K7 is a really always a part of our program. So we have these 20 key nutrients. You can look them up. The products that I produce with Alkaline for Life are professional grade products that have all these nutrients in them. Then we can talk about digestion and detoxification. If you have a serious bone problem, likely you also have a digestive problem. You're not absorbing the nutrients really well. I mean, a great possibility. So we talk a lot about digestion. We talk a lot about detoxification. Uh, I mean, just a person who might say, I can't take magnesium. How many people have I heard say, well, I'm allergic to magnesium. It's not good for me. You know, because they get a loose stool or diarrhea. They get diarrhea because they have a block to magnesium uptake because the calcium magnesium ATPase channel is blocked often by plasticizers, by what they call now forever pollutants that never leave the body, never leave the environment. And those things block that channel. So you can't take the magnesium up. So it stays in the stool, causing irritation and people get diarrhea. The mentor I worked with figured out a solution, how to create a neutral pore to take the magnesium into the cell another way. And I can tell you about that if you want. But so detoxification, really, really big. These glycophosphates, this Roundup stuff that affects the whole world directly acidifies the body, directly damages the bone building cells. I mean, we, we'd be better sticking to the Native American idea. When we do something to the earth, think about seven generations. How will seven generations from now, uh, how will this turn out for them? And exercise, as I mentioned, there's nothing as potent as exercise. For almost any, I almost challenge you for any disorder, you know, whether it's whether it's a, you know, whether it's cancer or diabetes or 
uh, risk of cardiovascular problems, little compares with exercise and to have lifelong pattern of exercise. And how do I know? We look at our muscle mass. This is the trick. We just as we lose bone about about 1% a year or half a percent after we're after maybe 60. You, know, you all probably know that during the menopause transition, those 10 years around menopause, the average woman loses 10% of her bone mass. Many women lose 20%. And so, but after that, it quiets down. But there's a natural tendency. It's like the sages say, it's like they say in Ayurveda. We actually, we were just a couple little cells and then we accumulate earth. We take things from the earth, all the food, all everything we get is from the earth and from the, and from the air. We build a strong body, but then in the end, we give everything back to mother nature. She takes back every atom and she takes it back kind of, as we get older, she takes it back slowly, kind of graciously, like you tend to lose muscle and alkalizing helps lose, helps preserve muscle because you lose muscle, breaking down muscle to get out glutamine to buffer the acids because the kidneys do not function so effectively to buffer acids as we age. And if you want an other fun frontier, kidneys are the organs that in a more elevated understanding that control bone and traditional Chinese medicine knows this. All your acupuncturists, all your Chinese herbalists know this. The kidneys are the source of our natal energy and they control bone. Western medicine knows it too because kidney control like the vitamin D and kidney decides which minerals are staying in the body and which minerals are losing the body. Like just today, I saw a client, she's losing five, 750 milligrams of calcium a day in her urine. Now, if you think about any of, some of you probably have had a test for 24 hour urine calcium loss, you go home with a jug, you collect your urine, right? You should have because 20% of the people with osteoporosis are losing calcium in the urine. And why is that important? Okay, so say you consume a thousand milligrams of magnesium. You can only absorb at best probably 20% of that. So you're getting two, uh, calcium. You, 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 eat a, you eat a thousand, you absorb 20%, so you got 200. If you're losing 500 in the urine, where do you think that's coming from? It's coming from bone. And that's a major cause of bone loss, a loss of calcium in the urine. And it's quite, it's, it often, it's quite simple because it's your two acid and that's what's causing that loss, let, let loss. Other times it can be complicated kidney problem, but just know that an important step is to try to understand the causes of your particular situation and then develop this whole program with diet, exercise, nutrients, detoxification. And the last part, is stress and worry. And I can tell you this after 35 years working with people, there's nothing that holds more power over the body than thoughts held in the mind. And if we, it does well to review our thoughts and to become a witness of our thoughts. What am I thinking on a regular basis? I'm thinking I'm not good enough. I think I'm going to fracture. I think that nobody cares for me. I think that I'm going to end up dilapidated. Whatever we think has a, we're telling a signal to the body. We're saying, we're dictating our future. So awareness of the fact that our mind and our emotions, every thought produces a cascade of chemicals. And like Deepak Chopra says, one of my favorite colleagues, if you have a, if you have a, a happy thought, every cell becomes happy just like that. If you have a stressful thought or a thought of fear, every cell goes into fear and that fear is very damaging to bone. <clears throat> in Chinese medicine, fear, very famous Qigong master told me, you know, Susan, you can do all the work with bone health you want, but you're never gonna solve the problem in this country because it's caused by fear and that affects the kidney and it damages the ability to preserve bone. So just have some fun with that. You know, think about the, think about the possibility that every thought has an impact on the body. And you know what the sages say? Every thought has an impact on the universe. So on top of that, we're adding fear to the universe, <laughs> which is not really good. So yeah, yeah, it's just fun. You can, the reason I, got, I stayed interested in this is because there's such magic. You could spend your whole life trying to understand one single cell. I mean, it is so complicated and such a high degree of intelligence. 
But I didn't get interested in that. I got interested in the big picture. So how does it fit that little, this microcosm of the body? How does it fit into the whole gigantic cosmos of this terrific creative universe? Have any of you been watching the James Watt telescope that has now gotten out to the edge of time where they think the Big Bang occurred? Anybody watch that? That they sent this telescope way out in space? Like, was it 36 billion years? They light, the light they're seeing now on that, they're 36 billion years old. I mean, it's like, it's mind boggling. And they think they are right at where the Big Bang occurred. Um, it's like, it's like, if we don't live in wonder, we're not paying attention. I mean, it is just, and so I am constantly in wonder about bone, a simple thing like a bone cell, but constantly in wonder how this human apparatus can get back to the, to the sovereignty and to the brilliance that we really have within each one of us. So I'm happy to answer any of your nuts and bolts questions you want, but um, yeah, remember the steps and there's a ton. <laughs> That's oh, like, this is awesome. <laughs> we have so many questions, but that was fantastic. I love, I love the circle. Uh, I love the steps. Yeah. Um, I'm I'm hugely interested in many of what you have to say, and especially, uh, you know, just the the focus on on emotion. Yeah, uh, it's really interesting how you have really, um, you know, you can see a lot of uh, change and um, maturation in in your thinking in terms of all the things that bone health encompasses. It's quite exciting to yes. have seen yeah. what you you're all about. So I, I just want to say, um, we have starting with two questions, and I'm going to bring myself up with you. Uh, if I could just for a moment, uh, although I'm not yeah, sure. I'm just going to I'm just going to grab yeah. one. I'm going to grab yeah. one. I want to show you that from a, yeah. which would really help people that are interested. I have I have started a group that I call the um, uh, those, those who want to take a deeper dive a deeper dive into really thinking about the order of this human body and the order of the universe. And, and it really is deeply, uh, the great knowledge comes from traditional Chinese medicine and from Ayurveda, the medicine of India. I'm going to show you a wonderful book and a wonderful teacher who's giving all kinds of courses. Uh, and, and so like we do the nuts and bolts of bone in our better bone solution, but these, uh, these, uh, these people from these wisdom driven cultures have a much bigger picture of the, of the, role of humans and human consciousness. But let me just grab that book while you're finding your thing and then we'll answer whatever okay. questions. All right. Um, I wanted to uh, start with, I see some of your questions in the chat and I'm going to uh, bring those up, but we also had a, two questions that came prior to um, this program and there may have been more. I know I had sent Dr. Brown several of your questions previously. so. Please put them back into the chat if I have if I don't address them right now. Okay, so um, one question you have is uh, this one, Dr. Brown. I recently read about the importance of protein. Yes. This person says, uh, "Do you see any difference in and do you have any opinion on protein? First of all, on how much, and is there a difference in plant-based versus animal-based?" Okay, so the first thing to know. Oh is, yes, I forgot about the book. <clears throat> go to your, go to your chemistry, your standard metabolic panel. The doctor does where he measures cholesterol and all this. Look at the BUN. That's urea nitrogen. If that urea nitri nitrogen, that is a test for kidney function. So the doctors look. They worry if it's high, but we worry if it's low. If it's low, it means you don't have enough protein. You want a fifteen on that BUN. It's called BUN or urea nitrogen. If you're below fifteen, you know you don't have enough protein. And we feel it's very clear that you need protein, and you actually need more protein as you age. Like my mentor says, sixty grams. I think maybe seventy or eighty, and it depends, of course, on how much exercise you do. And you don't want to get excess protein unless you have the minerals to buffer it, because excess protein, if you don't use the protein, it leaves an acid, a sulfuric acid, just like acid rain. And so, watch your pHs. Measure your first morning urine. You may need more magnesium. In, in, in different types of alkalizing salts of magnesium, you always want to get a product, a mineral that's attached with these Krebs cycle intermediaries like ascorbates or citrates or glycinates there, that that thing the minerals attached to alkalizes the chemistry. Um, 
So yeah, protein is real important. Your bone is half protein by volume, half collagen. And to maintain muscle mass with the age and older people eat less protein. A big problem is we tend to lose our appetite. And also we don't do the much exercise. So we don't have big appetites. So yeah, you have to like, I could just as easily have a peanut butter, a nice great muffin with peanut butter and, and not be hungry for a long time. But I have to resist it because then you're, you feel satisfied, but you're not getting a, a trace of the minerals that you need. So yeah, protein is real important. As far as plant, I mean, if you if you digest well, you know, there's there's there is the idea of you have to get all the different amino acids, this protein combining that you want to have the the rice and the beans or the nuts and the seeds, the, the hummus, for example. You can look up the protein combining, and we have it on our site. Protein. So if as long as you can get the BUN to be 15, then however you like to do it. Many clients use protein powders. Um, I myself use a protein powder, uh, but uh, yeah, so that's protein, good idea. Great, great. Thank you, thank you. That's a great question. Um, one other question is um, in eating high oxalate foods, yep. mm -hmm. um, so if, um, should we add the calcium that we've eaten or does the oxalate completely wipe out the well i mean let's say, say you take a lot of spinach i mean it's it has oxalates and so you don't get the calcium from the spinach so um i i generally do not consider oxalates to be a problem the body seems to have adjusted it to well do really well there are some people that come to me that are just totally convinced that oxalates are collecting and causing a potty a problem. And you can actually get a dipstick if you if you want, you can get a dip, dipstick for oxalates and see just if it if they come up and down with your diet. But I, I wouldn't worry about that. I would take, you know, I would take an adequate form of, of of nutrients. And you can you can see our guidelines for how much magnesium, zinc, copper, and all that. And I think okay. so easy. they won't really you don't believe they'd have a large impact on the calcium absorption? Well, you won't absorb what I have heard. And I didn't really look at this research, but my colleagues have said that you won't say spinach. You won't absorb the calcium in spinach because of the oxalates. But it doesn't mean you're gonna, that's going to keep you from absorbing other forms of calcium that you have in that meal. Oh, that's good to know. Like, for example, if you were to have a shake and put uh, spinach in the shake, then you... I don't think... That, that is my impression, you know, and if somebody, this is a fun thing, because today we have this amazing ability to search the medical database, you just go to google.scholar, you can research that yourself, see if somebody's looked into that thing, if they mix spinach with a, you know, spinach and see how it, I think they have, yeah. because I've heard that it doesn't affect that, but. Okay, yeah, yeah. All right. well, great. Uh, okay, another question. Um, how about the supplement that you would take? I know if, if there was a lot of questions on oxalate. So if you were taking a supplement with it, you don't think that would matter either? With the spinach? Yes. No, I don't think so. Egg no. meal? Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, now let's see what else. Another question is, I've read that tea, especially black tea, can be good for bone health, but caffeine, it could be bad. Mm -hmm. uh, is there a balance or what is your take on those two things? Well, you know, again, this is where the anthropology comes in. Around the world, teas are used. Teas are can be wonderful forms of herbs. And there are people that drink teas. I don't care if it's black, green tea, tea, whatever, they have better bone strength. And so it's just that the... the now, these are cultures where people live kind of, a, you know, like the Asian cultures, they live a more natural lifestyle. It's not that they're sitting around like I had a friend who drank probably 20 cups of coffee or 10 cups of coffee a day at least and ate very little because the coffee was satisfying. It, it, and it, I lived in when I worked in the Dominican Republic, the peasants would say, el café alimenta, that the coffee nourishes because you feel good with it, but it's like a substitute for really nutrients. Although... I mean, coffee is an herb in itself. It's a very strong antioxidant. I, I've seen coffee. Well, I'm not going to go into that story, but it has a lot of energy to it. Um, coffee has a lot. So, you know, moderation. If you say, I love coffee, have a cup, a cup or two a day is not going to damage bone. If you do it instead of eating, and coffee is, a, is probably one of the major antioxidants in, the major, in this diet because people eat so few fruits and vegetables, that coffee is a potent. Coffee and teas are fine, but... 
yes. tea do higher amounts of coffee. I agree. I think some people drink the coffee to avoid eating, and then yes. you might not be getting the nutrients that you right. should be having. One, one other question. Uh, you talked a lot about the echo light and the, you know, having that um that type of scan as opposed to a scat a cat scan. Um, what what do you think about the TBS score, the trabecular bone score, and how that compares with um, or do you do you see value in that, for example? You know, it's interesting. Uh, I'm I can say whatever I want because I'm an outsider. I'm not, I've always been an outsider. I'm a person who can look with no interest, no particular bias. I personally think the TBS is an attempt to try to save a dying technology, which is DEXA in my mind. That's maybe seem exaggerated to you. It's a, what they do is they take that picture and they amplify it and they try to look at the trabecular structure. And that is that holds some potential, but you notice it's hard to get them. They are done a lot. Not a lot of people are convinced that they're great, I, that they're really great. But I think it's a, it's a good attempt to save those machines that have been thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars each doctor puts into those machines. Um, in Europe, for example, I just saw this another article of these some very smart dentists, and particularly in in uh, Norway, are looking at the dental, the premolars, the trabecular structure with an X-ray, expanding that and seeing the plates. The, are the trabecular plates sparse or are they nice and tight? And they can say whether the very likelihood that you'll have a weak spine or not by the jaw. And they just did a new study that I have right here actually talking about the loss of height. They can predict the loss of height they're going to have by the trabecular structure. So the, the, trabecular, the, 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 the trabecular score is like that, trying to take from that x-ray uh, to get an image of how those plates within the bone are, the architecture of the plates. And if you can get it, get it, you know, get it, because it at least is an attempt to measure strength. But all information is good. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And um, we'd, uh, we'd also love to know your take on vibrational plates. We hear a lot about that subject. What well, do you I, feel about I that? I studied vibration plates a long time, and I, I have a vibration plate, but I'm sort of the rough and ready type. My vibration plate is probably different. There's many, obviously everything in this unit universe is vibrating. If you can hook up with the right frequency, you can stimulate the bone building cells. And so, and if you have the right frequency, you can stimulate muscles. There's some vibration plates, the original ones have quite a big displacement, like the power plate. When you're on that, it's like a three millimeter displacement. So you feel it, you go, no, 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 no. You know, you really, and I have one of those type machines. I love it um, because what it's doing, it's 30 Hertz, 30 Hertz hot is harmonizes with the muscle. But on, unlike the machine you've probably talked about, the Juvenet by Dr. Rubin, uh, that this, this machine has high displacement and athletes use it. Athletes use it to build muscle because forces the muscles to fire 30 times a second. So you are really getting a lot of activity on that. Those muscles are extremely busy trying to stay in balance when you're on that machine. That being said, I have one, I, I consider it a do less and accomplish more. You can do less exercise and, and maintain muscle better, but no one else in the office likes it because it's annoying. You know, you're on it, you're jiggling around. And so, and you want to be careful that you don't, you don't want to you know, if you have a macular degeneration or you, you don't never put your feet flat on it, you're on your toes. So it's like a, now, and the other, but the research, the research shows at least half of the studies and the many, many researchers have looked at this, thousands of articles show that it does, it does favor bone. It helps with balance and it helps prevent falls and it helps to build bone, but it's not likable. And some people say it's perhaps safe, unsafe. The people that are doing this osteo strong, and I'm sure a lot of you have done osteo strong exercises, they use the power plate too. Now you have Clint Rudin, who I've known for a long time, who, who developed a low amplitude. You're on that plate, you don't even know it. It's the little frequency going on. And unfortunately, the studies haven't been, I've got to go back. I just heard a recent interview with him. We talked about some new studies, the studies I'd seen. It was only effective for turkeys and cerebral palsy kids. So we'll have to see. But when I looked at his research carefully, I thought there's a possibility that that hurts was enough to stimulate the osteoblast, particularly in people with low turnover osteoporosis. Those are people that are not breaking down a lot of bone, but they're building up less. The bones are like a sleep. 
Some of you may have that situation if you've bothered to get a test for bone breakdown, like the CTX or NTX, and a marker of bone formation, like the P1NP, you say, wow, my bone density, I'm losing, 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 but my bone breakdown is not high. When you look at it, my bone breakdown is like somebody on a bone drug. How is it? Then you say, well, what's your bone formation? That's also low. So the bone is not active. The body is not putting energy into bone. And my argument is it's putting its energy someplace else. And my argument is it's putting its energy in the stress response. Mm -hmm. And those kind of people, it's very possible that Clint Rudin's plate would help. That's wonderful. Well, great information. Um, I want to ask you two things. One is, uh, I don't know if we'll get to every question here, but how does the OsteoBoost pack compare with Meridine? And could you give us a little bit more? Oh, okay, so Meridine is the OsteoBoost pack. So Meridine is Rudin's thing, Clint Rudin's thing um, at the University of Binghamton. And he's been working on that for a zillion years. And uh, I, I have to look, I've I have to look at his new research because I haven't seen it. I did see, although he didn't analyze the data, but it did seem a small number of women responded in the early studies. And I think it was the low weight women and low weight women are often these women that are into a dynamic. The bone is not really active. It's not breaking down a lot. It's, the bone is like sleepy, but that's not the way I look at it. I look at the body's putting its energy into something else. We forget we only have a finite amount of energy and the body is always deciding how am I going to use it. Body knows that your bone's going to last a lot longer than the rest of you. So bones don't have a really big priority in the survival system. So I would be, I want to look at his new Somebody just interviewed him recently. I have to go, and I just the video stopped right away. He was going to tell his new studies, but yeah, that's so that that is um. You were saying to compare the Meridine with what now? Did you say with the with the product you were speaking of the Osteo Boost? Oh, we see the Osteo Boost is oh, all we, all you see about the Osteo Boost is in some uh, research releases saying it's coming. The FDA is trying to approve it. It's a it's a total new experimental thing. They're in a big jam with this wanting to go to Mars. And why do we want to go to Mars? Partly because we want to dig up minerals from Mars. I mean, it's a shame to think we're going to go exploit these planets. I don't know if the universe is going to like that, but the, um, they're, they're going to, it's very tough to be gravity free. And that's why they developed this osteoboost and it may turn out to be real helpful. And the, the reports I saw said that they're just working for FDA approval. So People, NASA has been working on this a long time. They haven't come up with too much. So maybe this will be helpful. Yeah. Okay. That's great. And um, uh, could you share a little bit more about how we can tolerate uh, magnesium? I know I personally know quite a bit about it and I use a product you have, um, but would you share that with everyone sure. else? Because I had trouble with magnesium. You know, and it's, it's Shelly, I appreciate you asking that because magnesium is truly the overlooked nutrient for bone health. And it's the overlooked nutrient for heart health. It's the overlooked nutrient for immunity. We evolved consuming a lot of magnesium because we ate roots and grubs and anything we could get our hands on. There wasn't all this refined food and all this denatured food. We eat a lot of magnesium is very, very helpful. We often use a thousand milligrams of supplemental magnesium, but many people say, and magnesium is what controls the cellular pH. So you want to pay attention. If you're low, if your pH is low, it has to do with magnesium. And of course, potassium is very important, but potassium comes into the body, goes out of the body where magnesium is really functioning in the body all the time. So what happens, as I mentioned, many people get a block to magnesium uptake because there's one channel that you get the magnesium into the cell. It's called the calcium magnesium ATPase. It likes takes magnesium into the cell where you want it to do its work. But if that channel is blocked, it stays in the gut and it causes an irritation or it goes to the blood and it causes an irritation in the gut. And so my mentor, Dr. Russell Jaffe, has now, he actually has FDA approval as an orphan drug for taking choline citrate, a particular form of choline. It's a choline and glycerin, a teaspoon of that with the magnesium, maybe maybe say three or 400 milligrams of magnesium and doing that twice a day. And that choline citrate creates a neutral pore. We have written some blogs on that. I've done some videos on it. If you go to betterbones.com and search uh, 
uh, or, or even yeah. two sites, betterbones.com, which is the about bone health, and then Alkaline for Life is about broader perspectives. <laughs> Alkaline for Life has a discussion of this choline situation. I'll be done soon. Uh, or, or have some people mute again, please. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and in terms of the uh, choline uh, citrate, is that something someone could take on their own, like, or do they have to submerge it into some water? No, no, no. Choline citrate is a liquid, so you just take the teaspoon. I put it right in my vitamin C water. Stick uh -huh. a teaspoon in here. Then I take, even if you, if you want to take a magnesium powder, we use. We use what we call, our product is called ionized magnesium, and that's three different magnesium salts. You see, it's hard to absorb magnesium for some people, so we use three different salts. This is Dr. Jaffe's three different salts. You, they, so your likelihood of absorbing one is better than the other, but, you know, and then you can, you can, most people can tolerate magnesium extremely well with that. So never think that, oh, I'm allergic to magnesium. It's just that it's not getting into the cell. Did it work out in your case? Were you able to tolerate the magnesium? It, it, it did. It did. I appreciate that. I did start using it. And I, I was questioning that because I was, I'm not positive I'm using it correctly because I don't put it in water. I just take it. Oh, it's strong tasting. It's kind of like a syrupy sort of thing. You, you well, it doesn't matter. How we, it doesn't you, matter. Okay. No, no. It's just, it, but here's the thing. Choline. Now talk about interesting things. Choline. 90% of the people are deficient in choline and they don't recognize it. What is, what is choline help? It's very good for the liver. It helps prevent fatty liver. It even helped prevent fetal alcohol syndrome if the mothers took that stuff. And even if they were still drinking when they were pregnant. Choline is what creates acetylcholine, a neurotransmitter. It's essential for children to, better, to get better brain develop. And it's essential, it's in every program to prevent dementia is choline. And I recently gave a YouTube, you know, these, these young people I work with, they have me doing this TikTok. I did a TikTok on how if you take choline, if a pregnant woman takes choline, it affects the liver to liberate the omega-3 fats in the liver. And this increased the intelligence of their children, of the, of the fetus. And we got 2 million views on that. 2 million people were really one day wanted to know how choline could help their kid be smarter. So it's one of these nutrients that's kind of strange. We've paid very little attention to it, but it is 90% of the people are deficient. And now it's being in the limelight because what's, what's the new problem? The new problem is cognitive impairment. And you're going to see just like they've developed as soon as they develop drugs for this cognitive impairment, you're all going to be given drugs. And they have these simple tests, you know, can you count backward from 100 by 7? Do you ever forget names, blah, blah, blah. And they're setting up already when you get a physical with Medicare, you they give you these. Sometimes they don't even, they don't do the physical anymore, but they pay for this cognitive screening. And then they say, okay, come back in a couple of years and never thinking, what can we do to enhance cognitive function to maintain cognitive function. And of course, there's some real scholars who have great programs like Dale Bredesen uh, at ApolloHealth.com. Dale Bredesen has been interviewed by every major progressive doctor. He has a wonderful program for mild cognitive impairment where 82% of the people see improvement. So that's like, as is, is an anthropologist, you see these trends coming down and that's a really because there's a lot of things that burden our capacity to keep those neurons active, but everything you do for bone, it's going to be good for the brain. That's great. I have two more questions for you. Okay. We probably have 20, but I'm just going to take two so that we can get on to the let you have your evening as well. But uh, what can we do if we are on blood thinners and we cannot take vitamin K? Well, you know, blood thinners, right, blood thinners are a really interesting thing, and you certainly can't use vitamin K if you're on Coumadin, but as, as the person using this, there are, there's a new blood thinner now that is not vitamin K, is not, effect, is not affected by vitamin K. Mm -hmm. uh, what do they call that new blood thinner? Um, I don't know the other one. I only know Coumadin. Yeah, yeah. So Coumadin is being phased out because it's such a troublesome thing but there is a new another blood thing that isn't affected by vitamin k eloquist what, what is it called yeah anyway they can look at the doctor will tell them or the pharmacist will tell you eloquist and Zeralto. is that what it is no there's no a, there's a few of them anticoagulants yeah not blood thinners yeah, anticoagulants, right exactly. yeah just yeah, that's right so you just just talk to your your doctor can help you 
Um, any thoughts concluding on salt? Um, salt. It's a lot of conflict. Uh, we know that salt is probably not so good for bone health, but then there are people that say um, there's a book called The Salt Fix, yeah. and it promotes salt intake. So what is your... But you know what, here's the thing. <laughs> the thing is, we've tried to make everything so simple. Like this is always good, this is always bad. It's just not I lived with cultures, I lived with cultures that would salt was the currency because it was so rare. You need salt to be able to live. Salt is a very important electrolyte, but we have certainly overdone salt and high salt. And originally we evolved on high amounts of potassium, very low sodium. Now we have low potassium, high sodium. So that imbalance is really significant. Um, but so we'd say most people probably do better if they keep that salt down to one or 2000 milligrams a day. Most people have like five or six. I mean, it's like in all of our processed food is salty. But on the other hand, if people have really weakened adrenals, if they're totally have kind of pushed themselves too far, they might have like low blood pressure. They might find they get lightheaded and dizzy when they stand up quickly. Those people do well with, with higher salt because you increase the blood volume. So it's not a one size fits all, but in this culture as a whole, because of the use of processed foods, we far, take far too much salt that is in its own right a significant alkalizing factor. Linda Frasetto, one of the major researchers on acid-base balance, sees salt as what research showing that salt is one of the major factors acidifying the body, excessive salt. Sodium chloride, now get a mineral salt, get like Himalayan sea salt or Celtic salt. That's much better. At least it has some trace minerals in it. But it doesn't it uh, do not have iodine. I, they're not iodized, correct? It's not iodized, right? But if you want, yes, that's right. And, and and that iodizing was an interesting thing because many people developed goiter and iodine deficiency diseases. However, you'd like to have a mix of iodine and iodide in there. And this is what we use. This is what Dr. Jaffe uses in the bone formula I use. Iodine is is an important, and there is a I think there's a good argument. There's still vast iodine deficiencies. So that's right. If people, but then you just eat a little seaweed and, or you take a, uh, you take a, a, a good quality formula that has iodine and iodide in it in your bone formula. I know we were, we were using, you know, Himalayan sea salt and all that, but, and it might have iodine in it naturally because it's sea salt, but right. why not? You know, I don't know if they take it out. I don't know what the steel is. And I went back to using some Morton salt sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I wish they make, yeah. So, yeah. So we like the the more natural forms of iodine and iodide, but I don't think a little Morton salt is going to hurt you. <laughs> <laughs> well, this and is it's hard to idea. avoid. You go eat any place out and you're getting a lot of Morton salt for sure. I'm sure you're right. Um, <clears throat> I know there's a lot more questions, um, you know, and I, but I want to just you say. Know, let me, somebody did ask an interesting question you gave me for okay. low urinary calcium. Uh, oh, yes. If they, if, you know, we tell everyone to get a test for 24 hour urine calcium excretion to see if you're treating too much. This person in your group said she's apparently excreting too little. So why would you have too little? Now, there's probably some doctors in your group and they can they can help out with this too. But basically, if you see a low loss of, cal of calcium in the urine, you wonder if the person's taking enough calcium. You know, you want to have some loss because the person doesn't absorb everything they eat. And you're going to, so you say, maybe look into the calcium intake. Are they getting like that thousand milligrams that the government says is probably a good idea? Or, or vitamin D deficiency or some medicines that cause a loss of calcium, like these thiazide diuretics um, that cause you to retain calcium in the body, just incidentally. And then there's some kidney problems um, uh, that can occur. So you wanna just, if you really have a low, uh, a low calcium excretion and you're eating adequate calcium, then it's good to have some of the doctors help you look into that. That's great. You know. Um... We appreciate you so much, Dr. Brown. And um, I wonder if there's any concluding thoughts that you might want to leave our group with that um, you just, you know, think is, is an important thing for all of us who are such um, careful stewards of our bone health. And um, yes, yes, yes. That's right. And just, a, just 
so you might have some fun. So certainly the, if you wanna know the nuts and bolts of our approach is the Better Bone Solution is an online course. It's got all these six steps to it. You can do it at your own pace. Your whole group could do it together, whatever they want. Um, that's always a good step. Your exercise program, you know, whatever you love, just do more of it. Um, spend a little time. My personal way that I'm now focusing on this mind body, this more, uh, this thing of the energy flow within the body and creating balance in Ayurveda, the word for the word for health is very related is happiness. And so I the same word for health and happiness. And so I would I would look at I would look at the Ayurvedic approach and I'm totally enamored with a Charya Sunya, S-H-U-N-Y-A. She's a Ayurvedic teacher. She has this book, Sovereign Self, which is amazing about people who want, want to be in a spiritual path. And she has the Ayurveda, you might start out with the Ayurveda lifestyle book, Lifestyle Wisdom. It's a, a really delicious encyclopedia on Ayurveda. And you'll see there's certain type of balance, this imbalance of vata that causes this loss of bone as we age. And then, and she was a master, she's the master of a 2000 year old lineage. I mean, like I try to remember the things I, I've learned in my life, Well, she's carrying the knowledge of 2000 years of that heritage of understanding the Vedas, Vedanta and the Rig Veda. So it's like, these are the ancient texts when people were more, when there was people who were in tune with the ability to download from the universe, the great intelligence that she's taken to study the goddesses, because she's taken a very feminist stance given her own life. So she's got roar like a goddess. It is so much fun looking at the goddess archetype. So you might you might think about this and say, hey, which type, what are these qualities of the goddess? I think women, it's not random that women are, actually men have one third the hip fractures of women, yet you never hear about it because women are more vulnerable. Women care, women, women are vulnerable. And so, you might roar a little, you might look at these qualities of these archetypes and say, what is it? What is it that I want to do? I want to develop strength. Do I want to develop discernment? Do I want to be able to fight evil? Do I want to be more of the loving, kind person? Do I want to be the playful one like Lakshmi? I mean, it's just so much fun. I just returned from a course with her and I, I'm committed to help, uh, to help spread that deeper understanding of the mind-body connection which we see coming through in all of these studies now. Um, just to close with, and they've done some studies on bone. They, they know that people who are happier have better bone health. They know that people who are dissatisfied with their lives have worse bone health. They know that depressed people have worse bone health. But the most striking study I saw, I've heard talk about was Deepak Chopra talking about men who had heart attacks. And somebody who's decades ago went in to study these men in hospitals and see who survived and who didn't survive. And the biggest factor was that added to survival is if the men believe their wife loved them. And that's such a striking thing. And I'm looking for the parallel with women because so many women are the ones that give the love to everyone that make everyone feel comfortable. So start thinking, you know, what do I need to draw into my own divine being to, to, to gather my power together that I can give to others, but I can also take care of myself. It's fun. I congratulate you, Shelly. It's great to see, it's great to see each of us helping one another. I would be, I'm just one voice of many and it's fun. There's a mix, you know, there's a mix. So you take what you like and what you don't like, you let go of it. But remember that how you feel, feeling good is the first step, no matter what you have to do. Every morning, read something that you feel good about. Uplift yourself. I like to listen to Acharya Sunya or some of these spiritual people. Listen to whatever you like that you feel good because it's going to set you on a healing day. Wow, that was wonderful. It's wonderful. my pleasure. It's my pleasure. Yeah, it was so, so, so great to see you again. And it's so great to hear from you. And yes, and I'm proud of you. I'm very yeah. proud of you. And I'm, thank I hope you. you. We're we're just uh, we're just trying to do our best to have it here, all of us. And we have yeah. a group of uh, of us that are interested. So thank you for 